Your Excellency, distinguished guests, fellow faculty, staff, and students. Welcome to the inaugural public lecture for the academic year of 2013-2014. History is a story of the past, a lesson for the present, and an identity for the future. In the words of the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, he who does not know his past cannot make the best of his present and future, for it is from the past that we learn. The Petroleum Institute is honored to have among us today a true Marathi leader. His Excellency, Mr. Mohammed Abdel Jalil Al Fahim, author of the book From Rags to Riches, A Story of Abu Dhabi, is a humanitarian, a businessman, storyteller, and most importantly, a keeper of the history of Abu Dhabi and the UAE at large. His, his story of the UAE's transformation of a Bedouin society to the country where the world, with the world's highest per capita income is particularly remarkable because Mr. Al Fahim shares with the world his own biography through the history of the UAE. Mohammed Al Fahim was born in 1948 in Al Ain when at the time it was an impoverished community with medic without medical care and proper schooling. And when the means of transportation between Abu Dhabi and Al Ain was the camel, uh, before studying in the UK, he attended Quran religious school, then Al Falahiya school. He spent several of his childhood years in the palace of Sheikh Zayed, when his late father worked and traveled with Sheikh Zayed for over 40 years. Today, Mr. Al Fahim is the honorary chairman of Al Fahim Group, managing one of the largest family owned and most diverse businesses in the Middle East. The business group includes divisions of real estate, hotels, automotive, travel, industrial, and oil field servicing, as well as advertising. A businessman by profession, he's a philanthropist at heart. Mr. Al Fahim is the patron of the Future Center and the Special Care Center, both nonprofit organizations dealing with children with special needs. Please help me, help me in welcoming His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Al Fahim to the podium. Uh, my book, when I wrote it, it was translated to 12 languages. But since you all speak Arabic and you all speak English, I will speak to you in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> One of the languages that was translated. Uh, as I, you've heard, I was born in and uh, it wasn't easy living in Al Ain or Abu Dhabi at the time. And growing up in Abu Dhabi, we had to grow up very fast because we had a responsibility. So sitting in my office on many occasions, people will come from Europe representatives of companies from the Far East, from the Americans, the Americas, and ask me, where were you? What were you before? I mean, we never heard of you. We never heard of Abu Dhabi, never heard of United Arab Emirates. We never heard of you. How come you suddenly exist? And then on a trip to South Africa to on a Chamber of Commerce trip, I uh, made a small presentation there. And they asked me, we never heard of you. Who are you people? Where did you come from? You, you didn't exist for us. And suddenly, you have a country called Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Emirates. Where did you come from? And that's the time I started thinking, I must do something. Because when I was growing up between 1950 and 1970, 20 years period, there were no journalists. There were no historians. There were no newspapers to write about our history, about the events. So 
I'm a businessman. I, I, I don't know how to write things. Well, I never learned to write books. I can sell cars. I can build buildings. But to sit down and write a book, I don't. I'm not a professional writer. But then I, I felt the responsibility. The responsibility that I must do something for my country to at least write down the history that not many people know about. And I sat down. It took me 18 months, one year and a half, to do my research, to go back into history, to find out what happened, where I wanted to know myself, whether we had roots, we had history. Nobody told me. I mean, my father, my uncles, grandfathers would be talking in bits and pieces. But I really wanted to know, do we have a history? Are we known, or we just popped up like that? So I decided that's what I'll do. So I spent 18 months writing about the history of Abu Dhabi and the UAE. I didn't write about the buildings, the roads, the construction. I wrote about the people. I wanted to write about the people. How did these people live? What happened? Where did we have the change? And that is exactly the story of my book. I'm not talking about big buildings and roads and things. I'm talking about the people. The people that I, I knew, the people that lived with me. And these are the young people of Abu Dhabi in those days. If you look at them, you will think that they don't belong to Abu Dhabi today. You would never think that these people came to anything. And they are poor, shoeless. The clothing you, you see, they are living in rags. You will feel sorry for them. In fact, you will feel sorry, you will feel so sorry for them, you will probably go and try to find out who they are and try to help them. But these are the, the core, these are the center. These people grew up and made a difference in our lives, in your lives. And this is what I'm going to tell you about, this, their story. For instance, just to give you an example, I have my friend here. This is Said. Said became the man in charge of the electricity for Abu Dhabi between 1967 and 1975. 11 years, Saeed Atir was the most important person in Abu Dhabi. If you build a house, a school, a building, you need Saeed to connect electricity to your house to your building. And he was, Sheikh Zayed said to him that one day, Said, if I had 10 of you, 10 like you working the way you work, 20 hours a day, I would have built Abu Dhabi faster. And if you look at him today in, in this photograph, you wouldn't have thought that he could have become anything. I'll give you an example of another person, Muhammad Fahad al Dahim. Grew up and became our ambassador to Morocco, to Pakistan, to Italy, and to the Balkan states. 
he became, he was in Ministry of Foreign Affairs for over 25 years. And he did a fantastic job. And give you another example. Muhammad, Fahad, Muhammad Darwish Karam. He was our ambassador in, Pakistan, in France, Spain, and in Tokyo. So don't underestimate people. You think people are simple, simple they are poor, but with work, with learning, with education, they can become something very, very important in their future. But it takes hard work. We all worked very hard. And among them, in this photo is myself. It is true that I am the best looking person in the picture. <laughs> but if you look at me in this picture, you would never think that this little boy could be stand in front of you here today and, and, and speak to you. And I'm sure you can guess which one. <laughs> All right. Hey, Wahid. Any? Lewara Dehamini? No. Hada? Hada ma fi dhurs? No, you're right. You're right. This is me. <laughs> See, I wasn't the only toothless. I was shoeless too. <laughs> but these are my friends. I'll give you an exa another example. I teach Sabbat. I teach Sabbat. He picks his nose in the photo. But do you know what he became? You would never imagine it. He became the captain of the port of Abu Zayed, who actually drives or he captains the cargo ships into the port. All cargo ships have to stop outside, and then the local captain will have to go there, and he will captain or pilot the boat into the port. And this guy became the captain. Can you imagine this? I, I, I would never have thought he would become like that. I knew him as a person who I go hunting with. We, we, we catch birds in the, in, in, the, in the desert here. And then he becomes the captain of a, a cargo ship. I couldn't believe it. Most of these boys work very hard, but they had to be taught how to do their jobs. And that's what happened, exactly. This is more or less the same children, but three years later, we are now taller and uh, still no shoes, by the way. <laughs> and then this guy here, for, for instance, actually, he's uh, one of your people who you know very well. He set up your institution. He, is, he was the chairman of ADNOC, Yusuf, Amir Yusuf. He was the, the person who actually set up Abu Khalifa. Dr. Ismail knows him very well. So he was shoeless too. Yeah, and he's not uh, ape. This is myself here, and I give you this one. We call him Fatso. When we were young, we used to criticize him because he was fatter than us. But he became your best friend. In fact, you, he's so close to you that you always keep him at heart. Because, in fact, if, I, if you look at your wallet today, in your pockets, and you can take out a banknote, you will see his name signed on your banknotes. He's the, 
the chairman of the central bank, Khalil Fuladi. So he became somebody. He became somebody because he, he went. This is our school, by the way, which had no water, no electricity, and no books. But we went to school. And he, but Khalil went to India. He studied in India. And when he came back, he was given a job. All of us, most of us here boys, were actually picked up and sent to England. First, we spent two years to learn English. And then we went into normal schools. And that's how we came back and we served our country. This is the back of our school. This, is, this, is, this area is next to the embassy, British embassy today, on the Corniche. Today, it's the most important place in Abu Dhabi as a location. There's a very tall building built there. Now, before that, it was a place where we used to go to school. We still had no shoes. And uh, this was in 1961. As myself, a little cleaner. <laughs> and this is uh, Tahnoor bin Saeed. He owns the uh, building of Marks and Spencer. I don't know whether you go shopping there. And uh, uh, Yusuf Amir and his brother, Bati, my brother here. And uh, most of these boys are friends of mine. We still keep in touch with, and we see each other sometimes. And these are the kind of men people live in Abu Dhabi in those days. Yani primitive, no education, and yet they went through life with a very difficult time. And believe me, living in Abu Dhabi in those days with no water, no electricity, no roads, no cars, it wasn't a picnic. It wasn't simple. But we suffered, but we existed. We held on. Those people who, our fathers, our uncles, who went to the pearl diving, it wasn't a picnic in those days. Pearl diving was a very hard, difficult job. They, they spent six months out in the desert, in the, in the sea. And you go for two days and swim every, all day long today in the sea and see what happens to you. So you can imagine what happens to them six months out in the sea with diet, dieting or eating dates and rice and fish. So it, life wasn't simple, wasn't easy. It was difficult. This is, you know, most of you know how people live in the old days. And this is a photograph taken of the old palace from the location today of Tasalat or Mark and Spencer building, which belongs to Tahnu bin Said. These are some housing in Al Ain. We actually lived in these houses. It's not that uh, we were built for, uh, to make a movie or a, a script. No, it was our homes. These are the type of homes we lived in. And this is our transportation. Doctor introduced me here as a man who has a car dealership. Yes, it's true. My father started a dealership selling cars, Mercedes-Benz. And this is his first Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> That's my father on the camel. So, we all went through life as a beginners. And this is Sheikh Said. This is the father of Sheikh Tahnu bin Said, Said bin Sheikh Bout, with his men. And this is the time when things started changing, when our luck started turning around, where we, started, we hoped that things will change for us. And this is the beginning of our, the change. Thrilling 
for oil in Habshan. And the port of Abu Dhabi, this is next to the Chamber of Commerce in Abu Dhabi on the Corniche, where a little bit of movement, a plane comes to Abu Dhabi. This is the airport in Abu Dhabi, which is uh, not the airport that you know, but this is the airport which was right to in, in, inside Abu Dhabi, next to the uh, Etihad newspaper. Some of the construction on Das Island, Abu Dhabi municipality and the policemen, the guards. And this is the man who actually made a difference in our lives. This is the man who changed our life. He was a simple person, just like us. As you can see, he didn't look any different. He was a man of vision. He was a man of uh, greatness. A person who loved his people. A person who wanted to do something for his people to improve their life, livelihood. He saw how difficult and how hard life was for us. And he wanted to make us better people. He wanted to create people who can sustain themselves, who can, who can become independent and live a life like every other life, every other person in the world. We were living in 1967. 67, in 69, the Americans sent a rocket to the moon. And yet in Abu Dhabi, we were living under poverty line. We were poor. We had nothing in 67. So our history doesn't go, our modern history doesn't go very far from today. But this is the man who actually helped us, who encouraged us, who paid for us, who created the country for us, Sheikh Zayed. This is on one of his hunting trips. It's my father next to him. My father was, to tell you the truth, he was not a businessman. He never went to school to learn how to do business. He was one of Sheikh Zayed's men. Muhammad min Mutarziyah. Except he, he could write, read and write. And that's why Sheikh Zayed took him on, because he could use him to write letters for him. And he stayed from, for 50 years with Sheikh Zayed. In fact, the reason why I became a businessman, because Sheikh Zayed once called me and said, look, your father has a dukkan, has a shop, and he wants to start, he has a business. But he cannot run his business because we need him to help in the uh, administration of the government. So we want you to take over the business and release your father from the responsibility. I was 18 years old, and they wanted me to run a business. I looked so young at the time, nobody took me seriously. Every time I sit behind my desk and uh, a representative from a company comes, he asks me, he sits there and he drinks coffee, he drinks tea, and he sits there for, for an hour, and then at the end he said, where's your father? My father is with Sheikh Zayed. Uh, okay, uh, who do I talk to? I said, you talk to me. He said, but you, you, you look too young. So what I had to do, I had to grow a beard. <laughs> I had a bush. To look older, to look more uh, important. So <laughs> hunting trip again. This is the change. This is in 1969. It's Sheikh Zayed. It's, it's being modernized. He now attends uh, functions, and he became the ruler of Abu Dhabi in 66. So it's been three years since he took over, and life is now becoming more uh, modernized. We, 
he, he started building roads, he started building uh, schools, he started building you know, uh, universities, and he started b building homes for everybody. None of us, all Abu Dhabian, nobody built his first home. It was built for us by the government. We moved into government homes, and then afterwards, they gave us land, and we moved into, and we built the land, and we created homes, and so forth. But it was always the government who supported us, financially and practically. Sheikh Zayed was a person who never went to school. In, those, in his days, there were no schools. Schools only started in 1959 in Abu Dhabi, where we went. And we were not even, by the time we went to school, I was 11 years old. I, I, I studied the Quran before. So Sheikh Zayed and his generation didn't go, have school to go to. But he was a man of real hard work. He wakes up early in in the morning at 4.30, and he leaves his home by 6.30, 7 o'clock. His bodyguards hardly have a sleep. They sleep for about four hours a day because he's on the job, checking, supervising, making sure the work is being done because he could not sit behind his desk and write letters or notes or read reports. He wanted to see things by himself to make sure that it is done accordingly. And this is what he used to do. He used to actually go and follow the work himself. And he goes to every project, whether it's a road project, housing project, building, school, anything, you name it, and he, he was there. And he attends social uh, function. This is a party we had to file for his succession we were holding in the club. This is the, uh, what we, uh, this is our old club, which was Lahli Club. And uh, I was the, I'm here, behind him here. I was the chairman of Lahli Club. We joined with Al Falah Club, and we, formed uh, Nadi Emirat, Emirate Club. After that, about three years later, we, mo we, we merged the Emirat with Nadi Abu Dhabi, and we formed what it is today, Al Wahda Club. I was the president of Al Wahda Club until almost the middle of the 80s. Then I couldn't, take, couldn't do it because I was uh, getting too busy with the work of the Chamber of Commerce and the business. So Al Wahda Club was the uh, was one of the clubs that we started in 1969, and it was assisted by Sheikh Zayed, who used to come every year to attend uh, a party for us. And this is one of the. Maharajan uh, al Ihtifal we used to hold for him. And uh, as Ahmed Khalifa al Suwedi, Salam Maktoum, Sheikh Zayed, of course, myself, and my father here, Sayyid Abdullah al Hashimi. Some of you probably know these people, so uh, I don't have to actually point them out for you. And this is my father with the future generation, Hamad bin Zayed and Hamdan bin Zayed, when they were younger. <laughs> and remember that first photograph where we had no shoes and no tooth? <laughs> <laughs> These are the same guys. So you can see what education can do. That's Hamad Fahad al Dahim, who became our ambassador in I told you about in last position in uh, Italy, Mohammed Darwish, our ambassador in Turkey, <coughs> in uh, Tokyo, 
myself. Now I look better. <laughs> I still ha I have no uh, window. <laughs> Jumma Mahiri, he was our naval commander. My brother, Abdullah, who became the Air Force commander. In fact, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, with, when he became the commander of the Air Force, he took over from my brother. And this is in, taken in 1968. That's when, the, when we were in England. We went to schools. We, were, uh, we already spoke English. And uh, we were ready to work. But we still needed more time to be educated. And this is some of the work that Sheikh Zayed used to do during the evening. From 9 o'clock in the evening to 12 o'clock in the evening, that's what he used to do. He, the municipality plans, the department of work plan, and he sees people in his majlis. So he worked until 12, 1 o'clock every evening, and he was out of his house by 6.30 in the morning. His family hardly sees him. And that's how he achieved what we are today. His hard work, and because he was working so much, we had to work with him. We had to be there. Muhammad bin Buti, the municipality, Chairman, you probably know, most of you know him. He used to say to me, I have to be at 7 o'clock at the gate of the Sea Palace, Beit al-Bahar, because Sheikh Zayed wants me there at 7 o'clock. And he was the president and the chairman of the municipality. Everybody in the municipality have to be there by 7 o'clock, because Sheikh Zayed will call, and he wants to know things. So. You, could, you cannot achieve anything if you don't work hard, if you don't follow it up on a daily basis. And these people had to work harder because they could not read. You can do a lot of reading. You can do a lot more work than they have achieved because you have the communication, the ability, the reading ability, the, the, the technology. Compared to them, you are 10 times, 10 times better. Some of the inspection on some of the housing that Sheikh Zayed used to do. And this is the result of their hard work. Not only Sheikh Zayed on his own, his, Sheikh Zayed, Sheikh Khalifa, the people of Abu Dhabi, other shiukh, and people who have helped us to create a country for ourselves. So we moved in a matter of 30 years, one generation from poverty line, under poverty line, from shoeless, toothless people to this. And that's what impressed the people in South Africa. And that's why I had to write the book to tell them the story. How did we reach to this point? Therefore, it is not a wish that we will do something, and then we sit and wait for it to be done. We had to go through it by suffering, by believing in what we are doing. We were the first generation who started this. And you are the second generation who should take over from us to continue that same message, that same wish that Sheikh Zayed had. And we, as people of the Emirate, hope that you will carry on. Why you are here today is not because there is a space in the Institute 
and they provided you with a chair. You are here because you, you have a responsibility towards us, your first generation, towards Sheikh Zayed, who worked real hard to send you and to create whatever this institution for you to go to learning, to, to learn. So your responsibility or the responsibility on your shoulder is much harder and bigger than we, we had. We were illiterate. We didn't know how to read and write in those days. But you know, and you have the ability, and you can do it. If we did it, and we were ignorant compared to you, you can do better 10 times over. Sheikh Zayed achievement, not only for Abu Dhabi, for us to be better people, but he created a federation, United Arab Emirates. We no longer call ourselves Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Fijer or Ras al Khaimah. We call ourselves Emirati. And we are proud of it. And yet, it was because of Sheikh Zayed's hard work. Three to four years he spent trying to convince the rulers of the other emirate, please, let's join together and make a federation. And they had their different agendas. They had different ideas. At first, they didn't believe him, or they didn't even trust him. But because he had to work, he showed them that he was a sincere person. He had the love of his people in his heart. Eventually, he convinced them, and they went along, and they formed the Federation of the United Arab Emirates. And that's why today, in the same institution, you have children from all over the Emirate studying the same subject. It, is, it was because of people like Sheikh Zayed who worked hard for us to create a country where we never existed on the map of the, of the, uh, of the world uh, scene. Sheikh Zayed wasn't actually working only in the office on the side. He was working back home too. That's the result. 22 children. And they are now our leaders. They are the people responsible for our well-being. And what we can do today is actually to, to support them. Because yet wahda mat saffaj. One hand does not clap. We have to support our people to get them to, to, to do a better job. Well, I want to 
you can know that you are as important as we were yesterday. Because we had the past, you had the future. And I wish you good luck. Thank you very much. A remarkable man, a remarkable story. He has been called a national treasure and we are honored to have His Excellency Mohammed Fahim with us this morning. Uh, if you wish to purchase a copy of the student uh, edition of uh, uh, From Rags to Riches, a story of uh, Abu Dhabi, we will be selling them just outside this room at a discounted uh, price. Uh, additionally, the PI libraries and the ILC have copies uh, if you would like to check them out. Um, Mr. Rahim also agreed, kindly agreed uh, to, auto, uh, to give you an autograph, autograph on some of the copies if you choose to uh, buy one. But before we break out the session, perhaps uh, we can entertain a few questions. So uh, we'll give the first chance to the students. If you can, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, introduce yourself first and then ask. So, yes, Can you stand up, introduce yourself and then ask a question. Uh, I'd like to ask you one question. Uh, actually, two questions. The first question is, uh, if we'd like to be uh, like you or better, to help our rulers to improve this country, what do we have to do? Simple. Educate yourself. Read not just the textbooks and the, the uh, program that you receive in the institution. Learn about the world, read newspapers, go through internet, try to find, and research, try, try to find out for you how people made it before you. How did they succeed? Read their stories and educate yourself. The more you educate yourself, the better person you become because you become independent. Ask the question. The Prime Minister of England one day came to uh, visit Abu Dhabi, to uh, visit Dubai. And he was taken all around Dubai, shown all these buildings, tall buildings, high buildings, and so forth. And then he was taken to a school. In the school, he asked the children, students, what's the difference between an educated person and a man and a person of education or knowledge. Every student gave him a different answer. He told them, look, an educated person is a person who can read and write and, of course, follow up on what's happening. But a person of education is a person who asks a question. The, the fact that you stood up and you asked the question, that was an achievement. That was courage. Among all these people, you stand up and you ask a question because you wanted to know. And that's what you need to do all the time, to ask a question. Pester the teachers, the professors. Ask them questions that you don't understand, about things you do not understand. Let them explain to you. And that's how you become a better person. Not being by being quiet and respectful and shy. If you ask a question, if you ask some, about something that you don't know, others will learn as well. And you become a, a better person. And that's what you should do in your life. Always try to find a question to ask, something that you wanted to know. Be more inquisitive. Try to find out how, thing, how the world goes around, how the people achieve and succeed it. Ask a question. And that's how you become a better person. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, may you advise us as uh, uh, students and responsible? My advice? 
I'm jealous of you. What can I advise you? <laughs> you have a better school than I did. You have a better teachers than I did. And you have better building than I did. And if I have achieved what I, what I did with very small and, and uh, minimum of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, reasons or, uh, or resources, you can achieve better than I do. I cannot advise you. You are the person, in a matter of two years, you'll be holding an engineering position somewhere in the desert where you will make sure that this oil flow continues to flow. So your people, your family, your country can live in, prospect in prosperity for a longer time. That is your responsibility in the future. So study. And the more you study, the more you read, the better for you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Students? Students, I think there's a gentleman at the back. The very back, the very, very last row. Assalamu alaikum. Umar Tariq Ahmed Khalil. Um, I have a first question, but uh, as a great leader, as your excellency, I would like to ask, how do you see the UAE is going at the next 50 years after the oil is reduced and, you know, it's, uh, an, it's, a, uh, it's, not, it's an irreduced <laughs> renewable energy. How can we vary the economy in the UAE? How can we create, create a strong foundation as we have the money now? Well, thank you. I can tell you about what happened in the past, but the future, that's my alam al ghayb But... However, we don't know what the future will hold for us. However, we, we imagine, we think that we will live 50, 100 years ahead. So we plan for that. And the renewable energy is one of the things that we needed. We have a, a sun, if it's 12 hours a day, so we must make use of that. The government has started doing it. But now it is up to us, the citizen, the private people, should start adopting the solar energy for our homes, for our businesses, for our uh, institutions, in order to lighten the load on our resources. We have a limited resource which is oil for the next maybe 50 years, 80 years. We can make it stretch longer. We can make it go further to 150 years if we do not use it up now. We don't have to use up our resource now. We can find other alternatives. And that is why you are sent to a, an institution like this to try to find better ways to create a resource that will take us further into the future. We in the Emirate depend 90% on the flow of oil. If that is de depleted or that is stopped, we don't know what to do after. So we must safeguard that resource and make it go for a longer period, as long as we can. We have to find new ways. That's why I want you to be creative. I want you to, be, uh, uh, to go into research and find out how can you help your country by finding a different way of uh, lighting your, uh, your, your uh, homes and uh, running your businesses. We have a responsibility still to uh, find, uh, to generate new so resources. And the solar system, the solar energy is one of the uh, available resources we have. 
let's make use of it. Try to maximize our use on it. Thank you, Bukharit. Anybody? Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, this gentleman. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking time, your time to talk to us. And uh, I, I was speaking yesterday to a student about a life goal and the importance of having a life goal and ambition. And I was mentioning to him how a life goal has to be so high that it's almost unachievable in your life so that you're always working towards it. So I'd like to ask you, what is your life goal, and what's your opinion on life goals and the importance of ambition? Thank you. When I was at school, when I went to the, my first elementary school, the teacher asked us a question, exactly that's the same question you are asking me now. He asked us, what do you want to do? And that question was in 1960, with limited imagination with no knowledge of the outside world we were 60 students 40 percent 40 students said they went to become drivers can you imagine your your ambition when you grow up to become a driver and 20 students said we want to be clerks. Good job. And the teacher said, uh, don't you have any bigger ambition? He said, uh, we asked him, you tell us, what can we do? And he said, you know, there is limitless things in the world. We want, don't you want to become teachers or uh, doctors, engineers? He said, how? We don't, we don't have books in the school. We don't have pens to write with. And you want us to become teachers and uh, doctors? He said, yes. Maybe now you don't have, but tomorrow you will have it. He said, we don't believe that our life will change. And that's what happened exactly. Our life did not change until Sheikh Zayed took over the rulership of Abu Dhabi. And he provided us with the pens and papers and schools. And from then onwards, there was no stopping. We wanted to be the best. We wanted to be the, 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 the high, we wanted to reach higher. And that's what we are still trying to, to, to achieve our goals. We have not stopped. We still have a long way to go, and we will follow it up. And I'm sure we started, and you're going to follow up. And the generation behind you will do the same. And that's how people reach their goals and their ambition. I think there's a question. We'll, we'll take two more questions. Gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad Rahim. Uh, I want your advice to me and the students. Is it better to have your own business or have a job? Uh, noting that most of our parents, 90% of them now, they don't encourage the student and their kids to do their own business. They don't take the risk, uh, maybe you will lose. Don't do that, no trust, and they are making them lazy. Mm -hmm. uh, dependent. Everyone is like growing with the housemaid. Uh, other people doing things to them. They, are, they become lazy and they want a job. They don't start their own business. Is it your advice to start their own business and be their own boss or have a job? Both of them are serving their country, but which is better for them? Okay. The easiest thing to do is to work somewhere where they give you a very big salary and you sit in an office and do nothing or hardly anything. But the challenging way is to think, how can I help my family? How can I help my tribe? How can I help bring in something new to our society? How can I improve something 
in my country. It is the intention, the intention and the willpower. If you are ready to stand up for what you believe that you want to build something, you want to improve somebody's life, you want to improve your family life, then you have a goal. And that goal you can reach. It will take maybe a y two years, five years, ten years. But because of your determination, you will reach it. But if you think that if you, all you want to do is start a business and make a lot of money, that is no goal. Money comes and go. You will make a profit one month, the next month you lose. Doesn't mean that because you lost, you close your business? No. Have a goal in your mind. What do you want to do? Do you want to improve? You want to provide a service that is not available? For instance, if you think about all these buildings around you here today, in this compound, how many of them? A lot. Why can't you start a company that will maintain and service these buildings? The company will find it much easier to work with someone they have educated in this institution to take over the maintenance of the building than somebody from outside. Think that way, that there is a niche or a space in the work of, the, of the your company that needs somebody to do it. So think, think about what can you do? Can you fill in the gap? That's how you start a successful business, by thinking about something that is not available already. Create something. And that's where success is. All right, we'll open up the questions for uh, faculty, staff, as well as students if there are any. Okay. Uh, my name is Omar al Wahidi. Uh, uh, from what I hear from you and also from what I believe is that one of the reasons for your success is because you didn't have anything, you were more motivated because of, you, you wanted a better life, but don't you think that uh, now, nowadays, we have about 8 million people here. Locals are about 800,000 to 1 million. The government is encouraging companies to hire. Don't you think that because it is easier for them to get jobs, to get educated? Don't you think that this made them lose their motivation to, uh, to work harder, to compete for their jobs, to compete for, to achieve things, better things, achieve higher degrees of education instead of depending on uh, hiring expertise from outside. You are right. You are right. People are not mo motivated enough to take on jobs. Because people, st students, graduates, feel that because they graduated, they must go into management level. They don't want to start from the bottom down. And they don't want to start with 10,000 dirham. That is the salary that, as a starting salary, they don't want to start with 10,000. Because they think they know better, they are, ex they are educated enough to start from management. It is, in a way, true. But that was 20 years ago, when we had fewer students, when we had fewer graduates. Today, every year, 6,000 graduates come to the work place. Where can we find them jobs? In the old days, they used to take them into the army and then the police and the government institutions. But now, even the government cannot take anymore. The army and police don't need anymore. We'll have to find, you have to find a, a place for yourself. 
you will have to start thinking about becoming not just engineers. You can become a captain in a ship. None of you have ever thought of becoming uh, a pilot or uh, a captain of a ship. Your thought is about how to become engineers, but engineers in the oil field, not just onshore, offshore too. You need people, we need captains, we need people working in the sea, in, the, in these boats. Somebody has to ma man them. You have to learn to become uh, supervisors, you don't engineers in the electricity. Why do we have so many uh, expatriate connecting our telephones? You can become a telephone engineer. You can become an ele electrician. You can become a carpenter. At first, you start working with your hand. But after five years, you create a company that you can you hire a lot of people to work for you. But it starts. You must have the experience first. And that's how we've done it. We got the experience, and then we hired professional to work with us. And this is a starting point. Think about starting a carpentry shop. Why can't you think about a, a, a catering company? How many of us likes to eat? We all like to eat. So we can create a company cooking food for, for others. We just no, need to, to learn how to do it. And that is, catering company is a, is a very profitable business. Your own company here, Adco, uh, Adnoc, needs food for their staff, for, their, for you when you go to the institution here. Think about you doing it. Don't think about only the management. Think about how to start something for yourself. And you can bring in your friends, you can bring in your cousins, your family members to work with you. That's how businesses started and how it becomes successful. Now, I don't mind standing here for hours and answering questions, but I still have to go, drink, and eat. And so <laughs> are you. I hope you have something else to do than <laughs> just stand, sit here and ask me questions. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Your wisdom is an inspiration to all of us. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Dr. Taj to the podium to give you a small token of our appreciation on behalf of the Petroleum Institute. Uh, Mr. Murshid.